Welcome, everyone. I'm James Dedarian, Director of the Center for International Security Studies here at the University of Sydney. And I'm hosting today's webinar on Raising the Standard, Near Certainty, and Civilian Harm in Pakistan. We're coming out of the new Omicron wave in uh, Sydney, so we're once again going virtual, which means I'm coming to you from an undisclosed location, actually my office, which sits on the land of the traditional owners, the Gadigal people of the OR nation. So I want to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, last week, we held a global forum on AUKUS and submarines with Dr. Cooperman from the University of Texas. This week, our topic is also the Indo-Pacific, and we're looking at the geostrategic implications of powerful new technologies again. But we're moving from the submersible to the aerial, uh, particularly uh, ubiquitous, it seems like, weapon system and often controversial and colloquially known as drones um, that are operating in at the fringes of war and sometimes just simply um, by civilians or terrorists. Mm -hmm. And we're very fortunate we were, we were to have three experts from Cornell University's Tech Policy Lab. Unfortunately, uh, Sarah Krebs, who directs the lab, was called away. Sarah is the John L. Weatherwill uh, Professor of Government at the Tech Policy Lab at Cornell University. But we are very fortunate to have with us today Paul Lushenko, who is a U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel and he's currently uh, a scholar at Cornell University where he's pursuing his PhD and working on this, this topic. Now, it's interesting uh, for all of us to have someone who's, as they say, boots on the ground uh, on this issue. He's been uh, in, uh, in the Army, but he was a US Military Academy Distinguished Honor graduate. He was also the number one graduate in his class in the US Naval War College. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and he is uh, unfortunately also uh, adjunct research lecturer at the Australian National University, which we won't hold against him. We uh, are very fortunate to have him coming to us in uh, the University of New South Wales, which is uh, operating as one of our nodes today, and we want to thank them as well for this. His new book is out, and we have his co-editor with us, who uh, will hope will be joining us uh, shortly as well called Drones and the Global Order, Implications of Remote Warfare for International Society, just out with Rutledge. And it's really one of the first books to systematically study the implications of drone warfare on a global level. And um, so we're, we're lucky to have them both here. Now, Sean Ramon is a doctoral candidate who's doing a lot of the research as well at the Cornell Tech Policy Lab and pursuing a PhD, obviously, at the School of Public Policy and senior fellow. So we're very glad to have you all here. I, um, my task sort of to set the, the scene somewhat or give some background to um, people who will be uh, joining us. And it's in this case, I don't have to say much because the headlines have been lit up with, of course, drones. Uh, last Saturday morning, the, the leader of Al Qaeda who took over after the former leader, uh, Osama bin Laden, was killed by a SEAL strike in Pakistan, which is the scene of many drone strikes and much of your research. He uh, was taken out by uh, one, probably two Hellfire missiles. And uh, what's interesting about this, of course, is that there is no collateral damage, or so they say at the moment. First reports can be sometimes wrong, as we found out in the case of the, era, the strike that happened shortly after the bombing in Kabul during the evacuation of US troops, uh, where I think, I believe 10 people were killed, including seven children, um, and they basically got the wrong person. I put that out there as sort of a counterfactual now, to not a counterfactual, but certainly a factual that we have to deal with. But we're gonna get some counter evidence today. And I think this controversy should be evidence-based in how we look at the question. So I'm really glad that we have you all here today and uh, to lend not just simply more you know, uh, fire on this topic, but hopefully some, some light. And also to, we're gonna then sort of probably zoom out a bit to look at this in terms of the implications for the Indo-Pacific, but also the whole nation, the notion of you know, the US current policy on counterterrorism and that, um, that President Biden's always been advocating an over the horizon counterterrorism campaign that, 
relies more on intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, ISR, instead of boots on the ground. Um, and of course, the tip of the spear of this campaign is the drone. Um, so that's something we'll we'll take a look at um, after we hear some of this uh, fascinating research that you all are doing on just what is, what are the real geostrategic implications of drones and um, how have they changed the nature not only of warfare, but also our understanding of, um, you know, statecraft, what, what's considered to be a legitimate weapon, both in and out of warfare. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Okay, Paul, the screen is yours. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present our original research on the implications of a unilateral constraint, which is to say that which is imposed within a state and by a state only without multinational, international governments on the implications for civilian protection, which is in fact a topical uh, sort of conversation to have at this point. I was commenting with James, uh, was just on BBC World News, and the one question among many that was asked, uh, we came back to several times, was the extent to which the strike that killed Ayman al-Zawahiri, the senior leader for al-Qaeda in Kabul, did protect civilian casualties. And of course, the evidence will bear this out over time. So what we want to do today in the course of about 20 to 25 minutes is explain research on this constraint and the degree to which we think it actually can protect civilians, which is the intended benefit of the capability to begin with. It's a piece of our ongoing research towards a new book where we take a rigorous look in an empirical sense on not only unilateral constraint, but also multilateral constraint, the most well-known of which is international approval. Before we get into the substance of the conversation, I want to say thank you very much to my co-editor, Sindre Bose, uh, on this new book, Drones in Global Order. Uh, he happened to have a copy. I, I left mine at home. There are weight restrictions when you fly international, I guess. And he is a director of the uh, Globalization and Governance Research uh, Network here at UNSW, the School of Social Sciences. And we're so fortunate to have this venue today in partnership with Sydney University. So the background, of course, is no secret that drones, we're talking about the large armed and network drone, uh, the M29, Reaper primarily, which is manufactured by General Atomics in the United States, has proliferated by dint of U.S. Uh, use since the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Uh, George W. Bush at the time benchmarked this capability that had been growing over the course of literally centuries, but at this point was codified in a capability that would extend operational reach, that would have persistence, that would reduce risk to one's own forces, while providing the ability to surgically remove a terrorist in this case, while concomitantly protecting civilians. And this is the intended benefit of drones, the most important benefit at that. But yet we know collateral damage is not ameliorated potentially to the degree we'd all like with these capabilities. And it constitutes a clear and consistent issue in the use of these capabilities abroad, which is exacerbated by a lot of the lack of transparency and accountability over these capabilities. And so this drives us to really take a look at what the constraints are that govern these strikes abroad. And we take a look, namely at the so-called near certainty standard that was instituted at least officially by President Obama in May of 2013 that authorized or predicated a strike on the um, requirement for no civilian casualties uh, during an operation. And we study this question like some have done before more rigorously, which is to say through an empirical technique called the regression discontinuity, which the uh, smarter of us two up here will, will talk about, the, 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 uh, the econ expert. And really what we're, what we're after here is drawing causal effect for the rate of change over time that would lead us to believe that in future instances, potentially in different uh, political regimes around the world, uh, this capability would be useful. And our results, I think, are pretty clear. So the first result, this is a preview, is that this constraint resulted in a dramatic reduction in the imposition of civilian harm while also improving the strike precision. We define strike precision as the proportion of those killed that were actually intended to be killed in the first place, in other words, combatants. And when you take a look at this over the five to six years that the constraint was actually implemented, you see a recouping, uh, a, a averting of approximately 300 civilian deaths, which is significant. And in economic terms, what we also do is throw in economic terms for the first time in the literature. This means a cost on the value of statistical life 
between 90 to upwards of $250 million. I really want to just kind of briefly introduce before I hand it over to Sean for the empirical approach, drone warfare to baseline for your audience, the history uh, surrounding this capability. And so, as I said earlier, President George W. Bush inaugurated the first use of a drone around 2002 uh, that we know of. And this was a strike against an Al-Qaeda official in Yemen who was uh, suspected to have participated in the bombing of the USS Cole there several years uh, earlier. When you take a look at the drone use, what we really find is that it's based in large part on a globally expanding infrastructure. So as opposed to reifying the drone uh, warfare as a concept to the platform itself, we understand this is uh, really a system of systems that includes military officials that authorize these capabilities and strikes thereof, intelligence officers like myself who discipline intelligence, whether it's human intelligence, signals intelligence, to build target certainty uh, on a location. Analysts who would work for someone like me that really scrutinize the intelligence and the veracity, then finally the drone pilots to carry out these operations given the risk that's underwritten by a commander's authorization. But notwithstanding all these moving parts, and there are quite a few, I mean, it takes 200 personnel to deliver a munition uh, deployed and, and, and not many people know that. There is one consistency and that's the constraint that governs these operations we're interested here in the near certainty standard of no civilian casualties during these operations, but we recognize that the standard of certainty has ebbed and flowed across administrations and really is bifurcated in two different phases. On the one hand, reasonable certainty of civilian casualties. In other words, we're gonna make room for errors that President Bush and then Trump adopted. And then this notion of near certainty that President Obama adopted, and we think President Biden has adopted as well, certainly based upon the scar tissue he has from the strike uh, in Afghanistan uh, really almost a year ago now. This led, of course, to what we call a dronification of US national security policies. What we see here is really drones being viewed as a cure-all for terrorism. In fact, over the lifetime of President Obama's use of drones, he conducted a strike every 5.4 days. What that amounted to was more strikes in the first two years of the Obama administration than you had in all of President Bush's two uh, terms in office, eight years in office. And what this led to was really a more hazard, as my professor, one of the world's most renowned experts on drones, Professor uh, Sarah Kreft, will talk about a moral hazard because we have the capability, we're going to use it with a lack of transparency. And really, the fallout from an international humanitarian law perspective is that civilians are at the crossroads of unintended consequences. And so we understand drone warfare is the use of these strikes with different constraints to ameliorate unintended consequences. And we focus on the near certainty standard. That near certainty standard was really predicated on four key requirements. The most important was identifying no civilian casualties as unintended uh, outcomes of strikes and also sort of your conducting operations based upon a continued threat to US persons. This certain policy adoption or constraint was implemented officially at least in May of 2013, but our research as Sean will talk about shows quite a lag time where we can identify causal effect over time for reduction of civilian casualties. All right, I will just briefly chat through what I'll talk about in the next few uh, sets of slides. So I'll uh, roughly walk through the mechanism that we study and the empirical approach that we use to uh, draw out an estimate for the causal effect of this policy. Uh, a really important uh, angle of this that we want to discuss is how important the underlying uh, optimization problem is for a commander that is uh, executing and approving a uh, drone strike in the context that we study. And in that sense, we really take a look at this unilateral constraint and the variation in that unilateral constraint is what we end up studying, uh, which is the implementation of this near certainty standard, which changed the way that these commanders can optimize their strikes. Uh, and we then take a look at the discrete change in outcomes that we can attribute to the adjustment constraint uh, that's applied by the near certainty standard. So the underlying mechanism of these strikes uh, are two distinct processes. So we have the process of intelligence gathering and then the final approval process at the commander level. So this final approval for a strike is a function of many inputs, and we isolate these down to the intelligence that uh, uh, funnels into a strike, the collateral damages estimate or the CDE, uh, and legal counsel, which uh, adjusts their uh, advisement to the CDE as well as the intelligence is provided. And then separately, we look at strike specific intelligence, which is com composed of reporting by analysts, the intelligence officer's assessment of that reporting, 
and the drone operator themselves uh, approaching the situation from uh, real time and understanding whether uh, a strike is uh, needed in that moment. So when we study this near certainty standard, we are trying to understand what constraint does to this mechanism. And so we know that the near certainty standard constrains the settings where drones can be used. And so we see increased scrutiny for three primary inputs in this approval process. And that scrutiny is applied at the intelligence, uh, the, for the legal counsel, and then on the intelligence officer themselves. And this increased scrutiny is supposed to adhere the setting in which the strike is trying to be approved to the near certainty standard of no civilian harms, uh, harm as a result of the strike. And so to study this, we really wanted to take an evidence-based approach. And so we used data from the universe of US drone strikes, uh, collaborated and uh, compiled by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, BIJ in the United States. These are collected as a uh, watchdog organization uh, on the US drone program broadly, uh, and they're deemed the most dependable and uh, largest coverage of data in relation to civilian harm and other outcomes from US strikes. The BIJ provides us strike level data with a minimum of three external checks this is very important to us that we have this uh, external validity along with the watchdog organizations reporting. And so from these data, we uh, retrieve locations, the state, the province, the country of a strike, the date the strike occurred, and the confirmation from the US on all strikes that we use in our data. We capture civilian harm, child deaths, total deaths, and the total injuries from strikes. And we capture data from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen. And so we particularly take a look at Pakistan, but the important note here is that the data coverage in these other countries is quite sparse. Uh, the coverage of Afghanistan doesn't start until 2014, but the coverage in Pakistan and Yemen go back to the Bush administration. So we use those uh, primarily to drive our, our inference. When we're thinking about the outcomes of interest uh, relative to this near certainty standard, we use the BIJ data and their minimum and maximum estimates for each of these casualty outcomes to construct our main outcome variables. So for all of these casualty measures, we take the midpoint of the minimum and maximum estimates for uh, harm. Uh, and we also construct this measure of strike precision, which is the total number of total deaths uh, minus the number of civilian deaths as a uh, uh, proportion of total deaths. And so we can interpret this as the percent of total deaths that are combatants by the definition of the BIJ provides. We additionally use covariate data controls uh, in our robustness checks, not in our primary analysis. And we use these to ensure that the effect that we find is not being driven by political transition periods, weather conditions, and other things that may affect a strike, or religious observance periods uh, that may change the, the dynamics or composition of areas that we are looking at to uh, conduct a strike. And the main puzzle that we started with was the fact that uh, President Obama announced this uh, PPG, this near certainty standard, in May of 2013, as Paul had mentioned. Uh, but the strike targeting the actual mechanism and the implementation of the certainty standard uh, changed earlier. And we have covered this by uh, conducting interviews with uh, two folks responsible for authoring and implementing this policy, Luke Hartig and John Brennan. And so Luke Hartig stated that the policy was implemented 18 to 30 months prior to this May 2013 announcement. Uh, and when we uh, had this follow-up interview with John Brennan, he corroborated uh, Hartig's assessment uh, of this implementation date preceding the announcement in 2013. And John Brennan, for those of the audience who may not be aware of, is the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency who implemented really the policy under President Obama. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and so our analyses show that there is a discrete change in the strike outcomes in July of 2011. And in follow-up interviews, both Hartig and Brennan corroborated this July 2011 implementation date, which solved the real first puzzle that we were interested in, which is assessing exactly when this policy was truly in place. For our method, we follow work by a series of economists where we leverage a regression discontinuity design, where the outcome variable is the product of random error without anticipation. That is to say that we cannot ever predict the number of civilian casualties that could occur from a strike because the expectation for that value is zero by virtue of the way that we conduct strikes. And so we can say that any uh, civilian casualty that arises from a strike is either a product of human error or the constraints that are applied on the approval of that strike. And so we treat calendar time as the running or forcing variable where the cutoff C that we use for this regression discontinuity is the date of policy implementation. And so we use 1 July 2011 as this cutoff policy implementation date. And then we fit functional forms to the observations on either side of this cutoff. And then what we do to measure the actual estimate, the effect of this policy is by calculating the discontinuity in these two functional forms, the magnitude of that break 
in this uh, in this uh, regression discontinuity design. And so we're going to take a look at a few slides that uh, understand how we can do this in practice. So in a traditional regression discontinuity setup, we have a running or forcing variable on the x-axis and an outcome variable of some kind on the y-axis. In this setting, we would take a cutoff value C and draw a hard line along the running forcing variable at that value. In a traditional setting, we would then take the observations on either side of this cutoff and fit a linear trend or a functional form to either side, uh, only using the observations that are included on either side of this cutoff. And so this is precisely what we do in our analysis. What we're looking at here are monthly civilian casualties from US backed drone strikes in Pakistan with July 2011 listed as the cutoff. And our primary estimate is simply the magnitude of difference between those two blue lines at July 2011. And what we're seeing here is a genuine reduction in civilian harm in Pakistan as a result of uh, US vector drone strikes following the implementation of this near surgery standard. And so for our main specification, which this is uh, a little, little terse, uh, the main <laughs> takeaway here is that we are fitting these functional forms noted as G date and F date in the, uh, the, the Greek up there. But what's important is that the cutoff date is set to July 1st, 2011. The running or forcing variable, this x-axis variable we care about, is the calendar time or the date. And our outcomes that we study are civilian casualties, strike precision, and the civilian casualties per strike at the monthly level. And at the strike level, we simply study civilian casualties and non-civilian casualty deaths. And so our primary results, we just go right down now. Uh, I would encourage focusing first on uh, the first column and the, uh, the third estimate that says robust. So we see here that using 22 months on either side of this cutoff, we estimate uh, a reduction of 12 civilian casualties uh, per month as a result of this, uh, this policy implementation. Uh, and this is coming from a pre-policy mean of 13 civilian uh, deaths per month. If we look at column five, uh, in that same row, we can see uh, a reduction of two uh, civilian casualties per strike. Uh, and this is important as we uh, started before this uh, policy went into place of uh, roughly two civilian uh, deaths per strike. Uh, and so we see here at the strike level, a near total reduction uh, in civilian harm as a result of the implementation of the near certainty standard. And so the important thing for us in this case is to understand not only this causal estimate but also what impact this policy could have had on the potential for civilian casualties uh, as a result of these uh, uh, of the near surgery standard. And so we understand uh, that uh, our policy of interest here had a causal impact uh, on the trend of strikes uh, in terms of civilian harm to zero. But we want to understand how that can be quantified and understood in, in, a, in a monetary sense. And so we run a Monte Carlo simulation where we take random draws with replacement to create a counterfactual measure. What would have been are the number of civilian casualties in Pakistan if this policy had not gone into place? And so we, we do this by sampling observations from the pre-policy period, so before July 2011, uh, and we sampled the exact same number uh, of strikes that occurred in the post period. And so we do this because we know that civilian casualties as a result of the strikes are as if random and should be expected to be zero. And so we're estimating what is the error that is introduced by not having this near survey standard. And so we run a 1,000 rep, uh, rep Monte Carlo simulation, and the average value uh, of uh, the expectation of civilian harm per strike is about 2.8, which matches our, our pre-policy mean. And so we uh, validate our Monte Carlo in that way and understand that without this policy in place, we can expect uh, that a reasonable certainty strike would produce roughly 2.8 civilian casualties. We take the difference between simulated average deaths that we get from our Monte Carlo simulation and real values, which tend towards zero following this policy implementation. We find roughly uh, a little over 300 civilian casualties were averted by this policy. And so to apply this uh, idea that uh, these civilian casualties have not only impact on uh, you know, a human level, but also on a fiscal level, uh, we want to take this reduction in civilian casualties following the implementation and this increase in strike precision and using this causal estimate, project this counterfactual of 300 averted deaths. And then we take uh, economic implications from estimates of value of statistical life uh, in Pakistan from two sources. 
And so we find using these values uh, that this value statistical life calculation takes the averted deaths and scales. And we estimate uh, roughly 80 to $260 billion USD uh, is attributable to the near certainty standard in averted VSL loss. So if this policy had not gone into place, the loss, the, the, the incurred civilian lives would likely total to 80 to $250 million. And so here I'm going to pass it back over to Paul, and he's going to discuss the implications of this and uh, the setting of drone warfare and uh, discuss what we can do moving forward. Yeah, so here what I want to do is simply one, recapitulate the findings. There were a lot. And then two, what are the policy and research implications uh, of the research? And so again, uh, near total reduction of civilian casualties at the strike level, an increase in precision to near unerring accuracy, which is to say 100%. Of the time we're striking nothing but combatants. We averted approximately 300, if not more, civilian casualties. And in economic terms, a significant value of statistical life dividend for Pakistan, which is not insignificant given sort of the GDP scale we're talking about. So, what does that mean for policy? There's a couple of cases we put here, there's likely more, and I hope we can tease this out in the question and answer. So, first is that increased scrutiny, again, through near certainty standard and no civilian casualties in this case can not only limit exposure of US officials and presidents who are given wide latitude to conduct these operations in the first place, but also preserve civilian life that would potentially needlessly be lost. And at the same time, we've had to respond to criticisms that because of stringent targeting protocols, we've missed opportunities. In other words, what should have otherwise been a successful operation against a terrorist was missed because of the scrutiny that was applied by President Obama through near certainty. And we think that this really is not meted out by the evidence for a couple of factors. The first is that having conducted the operations in terms of intelligence gathering that go into strikes, time is really never a factor when you're conducting these operations. I mean, certainly there is this notion of a deliberate versus dynamic target, a sense of urgency, but in the case of strategically uh, or strategic uh, level strikes that we're talking about under 30 feet of operations, like now Afghanistan, then Pakistan, you really actually have a lot of time to vet the intelligence, conduct the operation. The other thing is that we get no evidence that there were terrorist groups, Al Qaeda or others that were emboldened to plan, prepare and execute operations from the FATA in Pakistan, this federally administered tribal area, uh, back to uh, the United States. And furthermore, what we did not talk about in the empirics of the presentation is that strike frequency, the number of strikes that are conducted by President Obama under this unilateral constraint did not decrease. They're actually consistent with pre-policy period of strikes. The second sort of implication here is really important to attend with this notion that strikes actually create more enemies uh, than they kill. The fact that you would actually exacerbate social, political, and economic grievances that can fuel terrorist recruitment and therefore embolden activities across uh, different regions of the world. And I think with the value statistical life findings we have, what we can do is back into the policy at the U.S. government level that governs how much money we give to uh, families who have unintended victims of these strikes. And right now, what we see from the best of, a, of, of reporting, I think from FOIA, Freedom of uh, Information Act request, and even some US government reports, is that the US government military really discounts the sort of value statistical life. And so I think on average, on balance, it's something like maybe $500 to $1,000 that were given to these families. And if we think this actually goes into fueling uh, uh, grievances and, and so forth, then maybe we ought to put our money where our mass up, uh, frankly, and stop shortchanging these families because it does demonstrate, I think, more genuine or sincere atonement uh, for these unintended consequences. And finally, is what we see, and this is quite provocative, especially for someone in uniform like myself, but nevertheless, is that the near certainty standard ought to be considered in a declared theater of operation. And so we talk about strikes in an undeclared theater of operations. These are locations like Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen that are not approved internationally by the UN. United Nations and don't have boots on the ground. Declarative operations are, are like Iraq and Syria, where you have expeditionary forces who are conducting these combat operations. I personally believe, and people I've talked to as well, believe that the near certainty standard has a place uh, in this environment, and that what you ought to do is weigh non combat immunity or distinction, uh, even over soldiers' liability to be harmed. Uh, to protect civilians uh, as well. And at the very least, the Biden administration, which is going through a review process on its own uh, drone strike policy, notwithstanding the sort of over the horizon label it's put on it, 
need to continuously sort of balance military necessity down at the tactical level uh, with civilian protection as a strategic, moral, and, and legal imperative as well. And this is the final slide before we'll open it up to uh, James is sort of moderating for questions, and I hope there's some, is that there is still sort of the opportunity to renew this debate for the global governance of drones. Of course, as Sindroy and I talk about in our book, there are regimes that exist. Uh, the most flagship one, uh, well-known one, is the Missile Technology Control Regime. It was built in 1986 or thereabouts to manage the proliferation of ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons, and has since been retrofitted to account for drones, but it's not specifically tailored against this. And then furthermore, if you have a signatory like a great power of the United States, China, Russia, they often are the biggest sort of violators of this regime. And there's whole regions of the world to include the biggest peddler of drones right now, Turkey, uh, that continues to sell the TB2 Barrett Qatar that are not signatories. And so there's a global governance gap here and an opportunity, I believe, to continue to think about what a regime may look like to limit the spread of drone technology. And then finally, if we take a look at the research agenda on this question of certainty and civilian protection, it really is endless or boundless. And there's a variety of things that you can do, not only in the interpretive judgmental sort of classical IR space to get at this problem and draw a causal effect as James talked about, but also interesting econometric techniques that are emerging, uh, spatial estimation, regression, so on and so forth, that we can also talk about if people are interested in what this looks like in places like uh, Yemen or uh, Somalia as well. So thank you so much for the opportunity, uh, again, James, to share our research, and we look forward to any questions that you and your audience may have. All right, thank you so much. That's fascinating work. And, you know, that's the task of social scientists is to come up with, you know, evidence, and yours is what we would call numerical, you know, this is a very sort of quantitative um, backed by some qualitative assumptions. And I want to test some of those assumptions first before we then open up to other more specific questions. And the first one, I mean, there are, I think, some assumptions here to your analysis that we need to look at or examine more closely. Some of them are geostrategic. Some of them are ethical and some of them are legal. Let me look at the geostrategic one first. What might have been left out in your analysis and should perhaps come under some consideration. And, and it's, it came, it hit home for me when um, I was uh, in a similar job at Brown University, not too far from the Naval War College where you were. And uh, we had David Rode, uh, who was a journalist for the New York Times. David was uh, captured by the Taliban. I think it was the Haqqani members of the Taliban and held captive in various locations, most of them urban. And uh, we, I had the good fortune to, or I don't know if good fortune is the right term, but to host him shortly after he came out, partially because of connections to Brown, got out, freed himself, escaped. And uh, something struck me. One of the first things he told me was, you know, I was terrified, you know, not so much about being killed by the Taliban, but being killed by a drone strike because they were um, happening all around him. And something else he witnessed is that every time it took out a drone strike, a drone strike took out uh, a member of the Haqqani's, uh, the family, two cousins, three cousins, and a nephew would step up and join the movement. So drones were a great recruitment weapon for the war uh, taking place in Afghanistan. That might differ, you know, in from war uh, zone to war zone. The second question I would have relates to war zones. Do you think that you know drone strikes are legal outside of war zones? Because there's a lot of international law that says no. Now, obviously, after the Patriot Act was passed in the you know the high emotional state that understandably led to a great expansion of the notion of a war zone, justifying U.S. military actions in various countries. But it continually got expanded, particularly for drones. So where do you see is it exclusion zones for the use of drones? And in particular, uh, we're seeing increasingly drones being used in domestic policing. And uh, how long before they become weaponized is another question. You know, posse comitatus mm -hmm. with sort of restrictions against military technologies and military policing seems to have 
gone out the window after 9-11 or certainly be eroded. Now, finally, this is my concern as someone who studies artificial intelligence and is looking at new technologies, critical technologies, particularly quantum and how it's going to change artificial intelligence. There is a tendency that I think you can document that um, starting with you know, network-centric warfare, again, going back to the Naval War College, a term coined by Admiral Sobrowski, who was the former president of the Naval War College, the whole idea of you know, getting inside the decision-making loop of your enemy. But with drones, it's also getting inside you know, any possible countermeasures and being able to strike before detection. And there's an incredible pressure. You, know, you talk about restraints for you know, near certainty against collateral damage. But there's almost a, a counter pressure now that I think will overwhelm that increasingly. And that's as war becomes even more automated and decisions are increasingly done by algorithms, we are going to see semi-automated drones. Even though Google, for instance, employees won't work on them uh, and other uh, big tech companies are uh, pushing back against this. But it is, I think, something that's going to happen in global governance is lagging, as you put it, very, very far behind on this one. And that's what has me worried, that we're moving from remote controlled warfare to robotic warfare. And generals, you know, some will say, not like this, particularly, you know, if you're Tom Cruise, you don't like to see, uh, you know, the pilot taken out of planes and automated. Unless you're Ed Harris, then of course you do. I'm referring, of course, to this trend within the US Air Force. That's spreading. Because one thing you don't want to have a lot of your body bags coming home, uh, meaning our troops, our, 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 our people from our na nation state, um, that's a big factor in war fighting now. And uh, you, talked, you touched on this and how it lowers the threshold where will you reach for the drone rather than put boots on the ground when you're fighting an enemy. And there's a lot of just war doctrine that goes against that, including Michael Walzer, who says you shouldn't fight uh, any war or, or any counterinsurgency or anything unless you are willing to sacrifice your own. Not a view that's held by most generals or admirals, but certainly one that's held by a lot of ethicists and, and others who are looking into the proportionality of just war. The thing that bothered me most, and I'm sure it bothered some people, and I'm sure you've dealt with this over and over again, you know, how do you put a dollar value on a life? You know, we have actuary scales, that work, you know, this, doing this in accidents or whatnot for insurance companies, but they're all culturally and nationally biased. You know, what's an Afghan life worth? You know, how do you measure that? How do you measure the mother's value placed on a son or a daughter that's lost? That's, and, and, and that's, that's the life, but what about the, um, how do you want to call it, their well being? I mean, I, one of my films, if you see a poster back here, it's Human Terrain, which you probably remember um, as the attempt by the US military to level the playing field in counterinsurgency by bringing American academics in, into forward operating bases. And I, one of my researchers for this film was killed at cost by an IED uh, because, but he was writing to me and by emails and talking about this issue about how um, many of these people lived in terror. They might've been potential terrorists, who knows? And, um, but they lived in terror, not, not because they'd actually, you know, the drone had reached out and touched them, but they constantly had that terror that something was gonna fall out of the sky and kill them. Now, how do you measure that? How do you measure that affect uh, as, as something, that has a value, you know? Of, of on someone's life. And, you know, I, I wouldn't want to live with that. I don't think any of you in the room would want to live with that. And uh, it's something that I think we need to take consideration increasingly with the use of drones. So those are, I'm, I'm, my job is to trouble. I, I do that whoever we bring in. So don't think I'm picking on you. I do a lot of work I have done in the past with on some of these issues. Um, and we had, for instance, we had someone who wrote a really good book on drones, Hugh Gusterson. If you want to really look at drones in detail, you have to consider the, the ethnography, the cultural ethnography of all of the people involved, the operators who pull the triggers, you know, target, the people who make the weapons, the people who are the victims, the people who are you know, perpetrating violence that justifies the use of these drones. 
And an ethnography gives you a troubled picture, a, a more complex picture. So I want to thank you, first of all, for giving us, you know, you, you complicated the simple, you know, black and whites here. And, um, but I would sort of bring in my, my hat as more of a ethnographer of violence for how, how do we measure these other sort of more non-tangible things that in, in when we decide to, to, to use a drone or not to use a drone or make it, to be, make it part of our arsenal in, in fighting these distant wars. So please choose any of those or none of those. Thank you so much for that feedback. Okay. It's uh, very poignant in these issues. We've thought about some uh, more than others. By my count, there's really kind of four things you've laid on the table here. The first is sort of the recruitment question. The second is the legalities operations and how it's evolved over time. Third is the potential for a fully autonomous weapon system and what that portends. And then finally is the question on potentially the moral dubiousness of this value of statistical life and maybe the attitude to the intervene. And so I think what we may do here is I'll hand it over to Sean to do sort of the recruitment question because in the paper we've submitted, we talk about the inverted uh, combatants and potentially recruitment up to about 6,000, you know, that figure, you can talk through that. And then also the value of statistical life. And then I'll close up here before opening up for other questions, I guess, with the legality question and then the autonomy question. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you again. That was uh, fantastic questions. And then uh, I, I want to address first this, uh, this question of value of statistical life. And uh, I think it's important for us to, uh, to understand that it's really easy to take a, a sterile approach to this and say this hard number means something. Uh, and to say that is certainly to, to exclude and to, to really, I mean, not take into account a lot of the, the discounting that occurs by just living in fear of these drones. Uh, and we see that quite a, quite a bit in, in ethnographic work as well as, as taking a look in survey work and then seeing that folks in, uh, in these model lands specifically do live in fear. And, and that certainly does have a, a uh, discounting factor that, that we don't uh, can contribute or account for in our analysis. The reason that we use value of statistical life in this setting is that they, uh, the values that are produced uh, and the values that we use are calibrated in some sense to Pakistan in that they represent a local trade-off rate based on the economic productivity of these regions. Is that going to be anything close to a true value? Absolutely not. We uh, make it a clear point in our, our work to state that this is a, an underestimate, if anything, uh, and that there are many other factors at play that we cannot capture. We still feel as though that is an important contribution of this work because we have not been applying VSL uh, and those kind of calculations to this kind of trade-off and, uh, and implementation, especially of these policies. Uh, but you are, you're certainly right that uh, there's quite a bit more going on, not even on the periphery, but uh, within sight that we simply can't quantify in the framework we have, uh, but uh, we discussed quite a bit in, in our, our work. Uh, and to get to your point of recruitment. Can I just ask real quick? Yes. For me, James, you're absolutely correct. I often, when I present this uh, as a singleton, will lead off with sort of the, the moral dubiousness of this term, because of course I was trained in the Healy Bull Center uh, at ANU, and I understand the sort of context normally what this means. However, it provides us leverage or purchase on the policy and the way that the policy is um, not effective, potentially in metting out dollars to atone. And if you take a look on apology diplomacy, certainly in a war memory context, let's say Northeast Asia, atonement when it's matched with money to a certain degree for better or worse has a tendency to relay a sincerity that I think the US policy on this really does not achieve. And that's why we choose to kind of plot in this terrain, although it is uh, quite broad. Certainly, and we expand that discussion to, uh, to thinking about grievance and thinking about recruitment. And we do uh, cite some recent work which shows that uh, each civilian killed in, in a Pakistan uh, US backed drone strike uh, had the potential to recruit uh, 20 uh, non-Taliban uh, kind of members. And I, uh, we, we scaled this averted VSL loss to, uh, to show that we may have averted close to 6,000 uh, potential recruits uh, by virtue of the averted civilian casualties that came after this policy went into place. Yeah, so that's pretty significant. And then Sean, if I could, I think Sindroy has a point on the affect or the emotive sort of side of this that you could bring up, certainly. Uh, I, I won't uh, take up too much time uh, other than to mention that uh, my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Michael Richardson at the School of uh, Arts and Media here uh, at UNS Nutley has been working in this uh, area over the past few years, really trying to examine the affective upshots and corollaries of um, you know, drone strikes and automated strikes and so on and so forth. And it's 
not just about recruitment uh, as a, 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 a as a upshot of grievance, but it's about um, a whole host of other conversations that might have to do with uh, uh, um, neo-colonial ways of thinking and doing, and how that proliferates uh, uh, perceptions of race and racism uh, in these uh, militarized uh, uh, dialogues and conversations. So there's a whole host of uh, emerging work that can be done, uh, but really it, it is about that dialogue between what you're working on and what someone like Michael uh, is working at UNSW, or uh, I'm thinking about um, uh, some other peoples in the US as well who've been working around ideas of insurgent aesthetics yeah. um, and bringing in uh, really different methodologies to query these questions. Um, you've taken a very quantitative approach. Um, uh, you know, there are, uh, there, there are feminist, uh, uh, post-colonial and queer methodologies that you can bring to bear to interrogate these questions about affective implications as well. And then, James, real quick, uh, because I want to get some other questions in here, but there are two hanging chads, a legal question and then the, the autonomy question. So on the legal question, it is true that most scholars, whether or not they're bona fide international jurists, will focus more on the international humanitarian law implications versus the international human rights law implications. If you take a look at the work by Dan Bernstetter, a really good mate of mine um, at um, the University of California, I think recently in Paris, France, it, he thinks it's dubious to think that drones in any case could ever achieve sort of international human rights law threshold, which is to say inalienable rights and preserving those rights to self-defense, uh, which is an outstanding question that opens a whole can of worms that frankly people I think are concerned about going into. As it relates to IHL, and make no mistake, notwithstanding the errors, the bot strikes and so forth, the US government and our allies and partners do attempt to abide by IHL. The just cause, the proportion, I mean, the proper authority, the last resort, you're talking about the legality of operations becomes quite contestable. And this is the issue in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen. If we can get beyond that, I think, and again, I'm not trying to sweep that under the rug, but I think the bigger question here becomes what do evolving patterns of drone use and constraint globally mean for the, the legalities operations? For the most part, we have a tendency to, tendency to conflate as a community of scholars, drone warfare to the US phenomenon of strategic strikes with unilateral constraint against terrorists. But the reality is what we see in Ukraine, what we see in Ethiopia, what we see in Morocco, what we see in Libya, what we see in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere are the uses you put it of drones within countries, potentially in ongoing conflicts that means the legalities of these, of these operations really is a misnomer. And what we focus on there are public attitudes of support approval and legitimacy, which links into my dissertation research, which I'm happy to talk about. But suffice it to say, when you vary use constraint of these capabilities as it relates to civilian protection, you get some really fascinating results for how people perceive the legitimacy of operations. And so these models of drone warfare, whether it's an American model or the French model in Mali, are important to understand, I think really constitute an emerging research agenda. And then finally, the autonomy question. The US military, at least, is a kind of a pacing item for this capability that does not have fully autonomous weapon systems, those that can identify, track, locate, and target on their own accord. There may be some capabilities within the inventory that I'm unaware of. I mean, to the extent we think these exist right now, maybe Turkey used them in Libya, I guess. Uh, and this was written about in a uh, United Nations Security Council report recently. But I think you're never going to get to the point, uh, even or despite some of the concern with the anti drone advocate community where we would have a fully autonomous weapon system for all the moral reasons that you would appreciate. We will, I think, always, at least in my lifetime in the US government and military, which is gonna take me out for I think the next five to 10 years, have a commander in the loop, I believe, because it's in that process of contestation, the infrastructure of the strike, where I think you really have sort of accounting as the human mechanism that if you outsource it completely to someone, something off the loop would even be worse than what we're talking about right now. Just as a side note, I agree with you on there, but that's really, again, taking a US centric view on this. Obviously, uh, you, you bring up Turkey, but we have the case of the Azeris using drones very effectively in the war in Nagorno Karabakh. And of course, the drones now being used in the Ukraine war. It's also drones being used for targeting. You could argue that's lowering 
collateral damage. But and I don't know. It's going to be very difficult to measure that one unless you had access to a lot of, you know, NSA or not NSA, but the equivalent civilian satellite coverage, which is being done. You know, there's groups like Bell and Cat and others who are doing that yeah. kind of work. I, don't, I guess I'll just push a little bit harder on the assumption that, you know, in a technical way, yes, drones have reduced, you know, civilian casualties and maybe even it made it less likely that, you know, some having to use a SEAL team or send in, you know, manned aerial vehicles. It's changed the nature of aerial warfare somewhat, you know, during the Afghan, uh, the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, pilots were doing double taps, you know, and I'm pretty sure double taps are out, are banned with drones. Is that correct? A double tap where you, you fire the drone, uh, people come to see what happens, and then the second drone hits. That's a complicated question, uh, James. I think it's condition based uh, in part and large measure on the intelligence surrounding what so-called first responders may constitute. But yes, for the most part, I believe the double task would be a moral issue that policy and regulations would uh, attempt to get away from you. Yeah, I think that's worth looking into because that's certainly uh, where most a, a lot of civilian casualties and you know first responders casualties have resulted. Um, and again, that's how do you measure that if people just don't come to help rescue people who are wounded and those people die because of fear of that double tap? That's something else that you need to, how do you factor that into yeah. your into your equations? Finally, then the basic assumption is this stuff works at a level of counterinsurgency. You know, look at how many failed counterinsurgencies we've seen. You know, Algeria, Northern Ireland, Iraq, Afghanistan, the Soviets in Afghanistan, you know, and then we can go on and on, you know, ones that Australians have participated in, Malaysia. Maybe Sri Lanka was one of the last, you know? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. So the, so the premise that you just need to find the right weapons to make counterinsurgencies work or the right strategies. Like I, I looked intensively in this while making the film, Human Terrain, that we just had to, you know, Petraeus had to rewrite the field manual and we we're gonna win, but we didn't. Um, and, you know, we're looking at $3 trillion now lost and we can't even how do you measure again the blood the blood and treasure is how they put it so i'm you know i'm always going to be a skeptic and you mentioned the headley bull center uh and headley bull was my mentor uh at oxford and and he always said to me that you know you know the position of a skeptic is the primary one you have to take as an academic otherwise you're not doing your job so i'm i'm, I'm glad that you gave me the opportunity to play that role and carry on with the work. You, you clearly are open to debate, which is very, very important on this issue because you know, drones are out of sight, out of mind. You know, it's very important to have this discussion because it's something that's happening out there somewhere else. But that's, as we're finding out in Ukraine, it's not somewhere else. It can, it can be at your doorstep very, very quickly when uh, conflicts ratchet up now in, in 21st century warfare. I just want to give you an opportunity to wrap up. Um, any concluding thoughts or responses, any, any of you all, before uh, we sign up? Yeah, I would just say thank you so much again for the opportunity. Um, and as a matter of record, the sort of conversation behind the effectiveness strategically of these operations and the policy is, I think, a different question, which we don't take a, a claim right. on. We don't have a value proposition. I personally think, in case you're asking me or us, that the the, the strategically consequential nature of these operations is quite dubious. In a great book by one of my colleagues, Sarah's colleagues, our colleagues at Georgetown University, uh, Mitt Reagan, you may know, um, who studies this, uh, Drone Strike is the book. He benchmarks 20 years of literature and really comes up with this key finding that it is not strategically uh, consequential. These strikes over time, there are certain conditions or heterodox effects that would mediate effectiveness of this, how old an organization is, how religious it is. The other thing, too, is that and I, I, I like the opportunity to come back later and talk about this question is the nature versus character of warfare. I'm one of those that think to the extent drones have implications for this question, it's really more on the character of warfare or how warfare is conducted based upon emerging technologies. And what I think we have a tendency to do, not you or those in the audience, is really conflate these two. The nature of warfare from your time at the Naval War College, you'll recall, sir, is that war is intensely human. 
it's political, it's a clash of will. So even though we have a respatialization of war, as Hugh talks about his work, the fact of the matter is people like myself continue to deploy soldiers into harm way to collect this sort of intelligence that generates these, these targeting uh, operations in the, in the first place. And so there's still a matter of risk that I think gets uh, kind of uh, forgotten about in the wash, uh, but nevertheless, really great points you brought up that we need to think about, uh, think more seriously and incorporate into the work. I can't avoid adding one note on that, and that, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the debate between the character distinguished from the nature of warfare, that, you know, there's something permanent about the nature of warfare as a political act of, you know, compelling someone to do something they wouldn't do otherwise through violence. And it's supposed to be a continuation of politics by other means. Um, that's the nature of warfare. But what I would want maybe to consider in your research and, and going, if you go further down the line, looking at emerging critical technologies, is how that same history of increasingly relying on the technological fix for intractable political problems, that, that the, the technology takes on almost a fetishized power. Yeah. You invest too much into these weapons. And when we talk about autonomy, I'm not just talking about you know, an algorithm or a microprocessor, but they take on a power. And in, in, in such that you know, even in the way that game theory and war games will then start to say, well, we can't do that because our weapon system can't do that. You get back then into the Schlieffen plan, okay? <laughs> Where, you know, timetables of trains yeah, determine right. whether or not you're gonna attack Germany, or rather Germany is gonna attack France first and then wheel around and attack Russia when they could have just had a small isolated war in the Balkans. So these are all very important questions and then they're, they're not gonna be answered by just looking at one single weapon system. Obviously, I think that's very important to add your analysis to historical analysis, to you know, give it the evidence to counter or to confirm some of those biases. Because one of the one of the things I've also learned is the confirmation bias operates and group think operates in a lot of military strategy. And interestingly enough, you know, places at the Naval War College, they encourage dissent and, and uh, some places don't. More so, I would say, in some academic circles where, you know, you have to do the same methodology. Um, you have to have the same, you know, historical perspective or you have to take it from a neo-colonial or post-colonial. I mean, the, the pluralism I experienced at the Naval War College was very impressive. And um, so I, I think people also shouldn't take a knee-jerk position that, you know, somehow, you know, when you have lives on the line, it heightens your, your methodological precision. I think, um, as opposed to just, am I going to get this into a referee journal article? So, so uh, I commend you on, 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 on straddling those two worlds. I hope the best of both worlds continue to be reflected by your research. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. And all the people who joined us, it was a small crowd, but we just started our semester and everybody's off, I think, now partying. I hate to say it. It's like Fridays in Australia, are like Saturdays, as you probably learned, but but um, it was, we're going to record this. We have recorded this and we'll do a light edit and put it up. And I think it's very, it's going to be important for on the record uh, for people to go to use as an archival resource. So I want to uh, thank you once again. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for hosting this as well, uh, New South Wales. And we look forward to more collaborations. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to, to work together before on some of these things. So please um, do um, uh, contact me if you'd like to do something in the future. Sure. That'd be great. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, please join us again. Uh, we're gonna have future global forums and webinars coming up with at CIS. Uh, join our Twitter feeds and all the rest of the social media. And uh, we look forward to uh, asking the tough questions and bringing in the smart people. Uh, and there's always something, some controversy around the corner. Until then, stay safe, be good, be kind, and over and out.